Algorithms, just like humans, can learn to become biased. At their worst, they can learn racism or sexism or other discriminatory behavior simply by observing human behavior. Now, if you're surprised by this, you should be. If you're like me, you've always assumed that mathematics and, by extension, algorithms were just unbiased depictions of reality, just simple input-output relationships. How could they possibly become biased? It turns out if an algorithm is designed in all the wrong ways, in which it either references bias to data sources or biased human behavior, it's very possible for them to learn how to discriminate against a particular demographic. Now, in order to understand how this actually occurs, it's important to identify why technology was brought into decision making at all. And the simple answer for that is they aren't unique. Computers are not unique. They're homogeneous. We each have our own uniqueness. We have our own cultural upbringings, our own perspectives. And while that makes us completely different from anyone else, that also makes us very inconsistent with how we make decisions. But because computers are all the same, that means they can be scaled up and they can make bigger decisions faster than humans can. Now, the trade-off is that computers simply follow human instructions. We are the ones that give them meaning, and they are completely unaware of what they're doing. And this, of course, creates problems when bias is involved. Computers are not able to understand what bias is, let alone how to mitigate it. So I've talked a lot about biased algorithms, but what exactly is an algorithm? The simplest definition is an input-output relationship with a bunch of computational steps in the middle. The simplest example I can give you is an adding machine. If you give an adding machine two numbers, it'll add them up and give them back to you. Now, the reason I like that example so much is because it really shows the dumbness of algorithms. They don't know how to multiply numbers. Like, the adding machine can only add. If it wants to multiply or divide, it's unable to do so, and you have to create a new algorithm just to do that. But if you paid attention to the media in the past 10 years or so, all you see is positives about machine learning and artificial intelligence and algorithms. And this is because, yes, they do have a lot of power, but no one talks about the darker side. No one talks about how bias can propagate through an algorithm. I'm going to address two different examples that are extremely relevant in society today, both of which are very high profile, large scale implementations of algorithms that have learned to become biased. The first is actually a more interesting story, if anything else. Um, originally, before algorithms were introduced, the lending industry operated by human agents. Humans were the ones who were reading through a loan application, analyzing things like their financial history, how many dependents they've had, etc. But humans are extremely biased, and they often refer to other extraneous variables that are far less important, but are breeding grounds for bias, and those include things like gender or race. And so when algorithms were brought into the picture, everyone celebrated them. This was a change that was meant to mark the revamp of the industry as an unbiased one. And to an extent, that is what occurred. Those variables that explicitly referenced gender or race were erased. But what wasn't erased were the implicit connections to those variables. An example of that is simply whether or not you live in a good or bad neighborhood. This is a variable that is commonly used in a lot of lending algorithms to decide if you're able to pay your loan back or not. Now, they use the, the thought process is that if you live in a good neighborhood, you're far more likely to pay back your loan with interest than someone who lives in a bad neighborhood, all else being equal. Now, you might be asking, how exactly are they classifying what a good or bad neighborhood is? And the answer to that is they refer to criminal data. Now, you might already begin to see where this is going. In the United States, criminal data and the criminal justice system is extremely racially prejudiced. And this has been shown multiple times over. Now, this algorithm learns to associate. That's its entire purpose. It learns to make associations between the loan applicant and all these other circumstances that are involved in their life. So when they take in data that is as biased as criminal justice data, they start to notice a couple things. The algorithm makes the association between minorities and bad neighborhoods, simply because minorities are more represented in criminal databases because of existing racial bias in the system. So once they make that association, it's not hard to see that if you're a minority applicant, which most likely means you live near other minorities, you tend to suffer 
because the algorithm will rank your neighborhood as a bad one and will reject your loan more often. Now, a study was done quite recently that illuminated a lot of these key differences. It seemed that black and Hispanic loan applicants were less likely to be approved for their loans. And this data up on the slide here is particularly for auto loans. Now, if you think about loans in general, the auto loan is probably one of the most important loans you can take out, simply because you need a car to go to your job, to go to school, to otherwise conduct your life as a normal person. But already here, we see that black and Hispanic loan applicants are getting their, approved, uh, getting their loans rejected at a greater rate. In fact, their approval rate is lower by 1.5 percentage points, as opposed to those who are not black or Hispanic loan applicants. Now, already right there, that is discrimination. But it's more interesting because this is algorithmic discrimination. There's no human that is, decide, that is making these choices. It's an algorithm that has learned from variables, biased and unbiased, like that of the neighborhood variable. It has pulled all those together and has decided that black and Hispanic loan applicants are higher risk. And so it makes sense to reject them more often and also charge them higher interest rates. But the most interesting number on this slide is the default rate which is ar arguably what people should be caring the most about. Black and Hispanic loan applicants default less on their loans by 2.3 percentage points. And a percentage point is simply the difference between 4% and 5%, for example. Now, this is extremely interesting. This is a clear demonstration of racial bias in the algorithm. Why is it that black and Hispanic loan applicants are getting their loans approved less often and are paying higher interest rates, even though they're more likely to pay their loan back? And this is what happens when algorithms are deployed at such a large scale and when they're constantly taking in multiple data sources that are both biased and, un and unbiased. And the most, the scariest part of this entire situation is that someone had to go and do a research study to illuminate the fact that there was bias in the algorithm and nobody knew it beforehand. Now, we're talking about an algorithm, the lending algorithm, that has learned from biased data. But what if... What about algorithms that learn directly from humans? That leads me to my next example, which is the Google search. So Google, Google search, more specifically, is the largest, the most popular consumer-facing technology service in history. It's so popular that there's a verb for it. The verb Googled has entered our everyday lifestyle. But how exactly does Google search work? Well, before they changed the way they did their ads. Essentially, every time you make a Google search, they would have a real-time auction in the background where a queue of bidders would line up and have each of their advertisements that they'd want to display. Now, Google's entire business is constructing a digital profile of who the searcher is so they can maximize the probability that that user will interact with the ads. So they calculate these probabilities. You know, what is the probability that you, the searcher, will, will interact with this particular ad? And they do, they do that for all the bidder's ads. And they pick the one that has the largest chance of you interacting with it. When they display that ad and you click on it, Google gets the money from the bidder. Now, Google's entire business is getting you to click on the ad. And so they'll do whatever is necessary to maximize that probability. And one of the best ways to do that is to learn from your searches. Now, an interesting thing occurred when you Googled names you were likely to get back one of two different types of ads. There would be a neutral ad in which it would just be the name that was Googled along with other words like public records or this person found. It's not particularly harmful, but it is kind of creepy. Um, on the other hand, there were the negative ads. And the negative ads have words like arrest or criminal. And this is obviously, this could be image damaging, reputation damaging even. But they show up nonetheless when names are Googled. Now, a researcher in 2013, who is now the director of the Harvard Data Privacy Lab, did a further study into this ad selection. And they tried to figure out what type of name would give back negative ads more often. And so they came up with a big list of black-sounding names and white-sounding names. Now, black-sounding names were names that, when Googled, gave back images of black people. And white-sounding names were similar for white people. And they spent time Googling each one of these. And the results were really quite scary. Um, Google had somehow learned to associate black, black-sounding names with the negative ads that had the words criminal or arrest in them. Now, this is scary, and the data speaks for itself. 60% of the black-sounding names that were searched 
return negative ads, as opposed to only 48% for white sounding names. Now, I think the more interesting question is how did this actually happen? Because it's very unlikely that Google meant for this, this association to be made. And the whole thing is a vicious cycle, really. If we assume, for the sake of example, that the first time a black sounding name was searched, there was a 50-50 chance that the negative ad would be offered up, a coin flip. But the problem is humans, especially in the, in the United States, but also internationally, we carry the subconscious bias that black is criminal in our heads. And it's scary because even if we don't think we have that bias, it could still be there. And it comes out in technology like this. Now, when that negative ad is first offered up, we're already more likely to interact with it simply because we want to confirm our suspicions. And so if we happen to click on the ad, Google does what Google does best, and they alter the probability of the negative ad displaying because now they know that you and people like you are more likely to click on it. So the next time a black sounding ad is shown, the probability for the negative ad to be displayed um, is now much higher. It's 55%, for example. Now, this might not seem like a lot, but when you think about how in today's world there are about 40,000 Google searches per second, that's when it gets really terrifying because this algorithm is learning 40,000 times a second to, to hone in on what makes its users click on ads more. And this relationship only gets stronger over time. Now, these are two, two algorithms that have learned from biased data, which is the lending algorithm, and from humans themselves, the Google algorithm. But what exactly is the solution? If you notice, both of these examples in, had to do, had to actually have people research the whole algorithm behind it just to figure out that bias was existent. So how do we prevent this from happening in the future? I think the solution needs to be multidimensional. And I think it starts with universities. I'm, a, I'm an engineering and a mathematics student here at UT Austin. And I've taken a ton of courses ranging from applied statistics to engineering computation to software design. But I never, ne not even once, came into contact with algorithmic bias until I did my own independent research. And that's not just the fault of UT. That's the, that's, it's a problem internationally. Universities tend to focus on the overly academic. They tend to focus on things like, how do we make an algorithm faster? Or how do we make an algorithm more efficient? But they never address, how do we stop bias from occurring in, in real world applications? In fact, ethics courses aren't even required by a lot of curriculum. And I think this is where we need to start, especially for people like me who are about to go into the corporate world and deploy these for, for, on large scale applications. Diversity is another big one. It's been a problem in the tech industry for an extremely long time. And the solution isn't clear cut. But the simple fact remains that if there were more minority voices as part of the lending algorithm, for example, maybe that disaster would have been averted. Technology, there are a lot of organizations, both College, both universities as well as foundations that are working together to try and figure out how we can make technology, ironically, more human-like. How to tell technology what bias is and how to allow it to mitigate that bias for us. Foundations like the Algorithmic Justice League are working towards this mission as well. And they're a great organization to contribute to if you want to do so monetarily. But I think the most important thing here is mindsets. We tend to assume that data is the ultimate truth and we never second guess it, we never question it. It doesn't matter if you're a STEM major or if you're an engineer or a data scientist. What matters is if you're involved in a big decision that could potentially affect many people from different backgrounds, it's, it's critical to ask the question, where is my data coming from? And am I 100% sure that there aren't hidden biases that I'm making decisions off of? But really, I think, to end on a positive note, I think technology has this incredible power to unite people, not just divide, as, as it seems like. And the problem is we can't enjoy the highest highs of technology without addressing the lowest lows. You know, the, the power to unify is what brought me to be an engineer, to want to work with technology. But now I'm seeing its ugly side. And, but the, the thing is, I can, I can envision a world and people who are working on this problem as well can envision a world in which this technology doesn't just work for the privileged few. We can envision and work towards 
a future in which this technology works for all users equally and without bias. Thank you.